Chapter 6 of Buried Alive by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Chapter 6 A Putney Morning. Except that there was marrying and giving in marriage, it was just as though he had died and gone to heaven. Heaven is the absence of worry and of ambition. Heaven is where you want nothing you haven't got. Heaven is finality, and this was finality. On the September morning, after the honeymoon and the settling down, he arose leisurely, long after his wife, and, putting on the puce dressing gown, which Alice much admired, he opened the window wider and surveyed that part of the universe which was comprised in Werter Road and the sky above. A sturdy old woman was coming down the street with a great basket of assorted flowers. He took an immense pleasure in the sight of the old woman. The sight of the old woman thrilled him. Why? Well, there was no reason except that she was vigorously alive, a part of the magnificent earth. All life gave him joy. All life was beautiful to him. He had his warm bath. The bathroom was not of the latest convenience, but Alice could have made a four-wheeler convenient. As he passed to and fro on the first floor, he heard the calm, efficient activities below stairs. She was busy in the mornings. Her eyes would seem to say to him, now, between my uprising and lunchtime, please don't depend on me for intellectual or moral support. I am on the spot, but I am also at the wheel and must not be disturbed. Then he descended, fresh as a boy, although the promontory which prevented a direct vision of his toes showed accretions. The front room was a shrine for his breakfast. She served it herself in her white apron promptly upon his arrival. Eggs, toast, coffee. It was nothing, that breakfast. And yet it was everything. No breakfast could have been better. He had probably eaten about 15,000 hotel breakfasts before Alice taught him what a real breakfast was. After serving it, she lingered for a moment and then handed him the Daily Telegraph, which had been lying on a chair. Here's your telegraph, she said cheerfully, tacitly disowning any property or interest in the telegraph. For her, newspapers were men's toys. She never opened a paper, never wanted to know what was going on in the world. Politics and all the business of the mere machinery of living, she perfectly ignored it. She lived. She did nothing but live. She lived every hour. Priam felt truly that he had at last got down to the bedrock of life. There were twenty pages of the telegraph, far more matter than a man could read in a day, even he read and read and neither ate nor slept and all of it so soothing in its rich variety. It gently lulled you. It was the ideal companion for a poached egg. Upstanding against the coffee pot, it stood for the solidity of England in the seas. Priam folded it large. He read all the articles down to the fold, then turned the thing over and finished all of them. After communing with the telegraph, he communed with his own secret nature and wandered about, rolling a cigarette. Ah, the first cigarette! His wanderings led him to the kitchen, or at least as far as the threshold thereof. His wife was at work there. Upon every handle or article that might soil, she put soft brown paper, and in addition she often wore house gloves, so that her hands remained immaculate. Thus, during the early hours of the day, the house, especially in the region of the fireplaces, had the air of being in curl papers. I'm going out now, Alice, he said, after he had drawn on his finely polished boots. Very well, love, she replied, preoccupied with her work. Lunch as usual. She never demanded uxoriousness from him. She had got him. She was sure of him. That satisfied her. Sometimes, like a simple woman who has come into a set of pearls, she would, as it were, take him out of his drawer and look at him and put him back. At the gate he hesitated whether to turn to the left, towards High Street, or to the right, towards Oxford Road. He chose the right, but he would have enjoyed himself equally had he chosen the left. The streets through which he passed were populated by domestic servants and tradesmen's boys. He saw white-capped girls cleaning doorknobs or windows, or running along the streets like escaped nuns, or staring in soft meditation from bedroom windows. And the tradesmen boys were continually leaping in and out of carts, or off and on tricycles, busily distributing food and drink as though Putney had been a beleaguered city. It was extremely interesting and mysterious, 
And what made it the more mysterious was that the oligarchy of superior persons for whom these boys and girls so assiduously worked remained invisible. He passed a newspaper shop and found his customary delight in the placards. This morning, the Daily Illustrated announced nothing but Portrait of a boy aged 12 who weighs 20 stone. And the record whispered in scarlet, What the German said to the king, special. The general cried, Surrey's glorious finish. And the courier shouted, The unwritten law in the United States, another scandal. Not for gold would he have gone beyond those placards to the organs themselves. He preferred to gather from the placards alone what wonders of yesterday the excellent staid telegraph had unaccountably missed. But in the financial times he saw Cahoon's annual meeting, stormy scenes. And he bought the financial times and put it into his pocket for his wife, because she had an interest in Cahoon's brewery, and he conceived the possibility of her caring to glance at the report. The Simple Joy of Life after crossing the South Western Railway, he got into the Utpa Richmond Road, a thoroughfare which always diverted and amused him. It was such a street of contrasts. Anyone could see that, not many years before, it had been a sacred street, trod only by feet genteel, and made out of houses, each christened with its own name, and each standing in its own garden. And now, energetic persons had put churches into it, vast red things with gigantic bells, and large drapery shops with blouses at six and eleven, and court photographers and banks and cigar stores and auctioneers' offices. And all kinds of omnibuses ran along it. And yet somehow it remained meditative and superior. In every available space gigantic posters were exhibited. They all had to do with food or pleasure. There were York hams eight feet high that a regiment could not have eaten in a month. Shaggy and ferocious oxen peeping out of monstrous teacups in their anxiety to be consumed spouting bottles of ale whose froth alone would have floated the mail steamers pictured on the adjoining sheet, and forty different decoctions for imparting strength. Then, after a few score yards of invitations to debauch, there came, with characteristic admirable English common sense, a cure for indigestion, so large that it would have given ease to a mastodon who had by inadvertence swallowed an elephant. And then there were the calls to pleasure. Astonishing the quantity of palaces that offered you exactly the same entertainment twice over on the same night. Astonishing the reliance on number in this matter of amusement. Authenticated statements that a certain performer had done a certain thing in a certain way a thousand and one times without interruption were stuck all over the upper Richmond Road, apparently in the sure hope that you would rush to see the thousand and second performance. These performances were invariably styled original and novel. All the remainder of free wall space was occupied by philanthropists who were ready to give away cigarettes at the nominal price of a penny a packet. Brian Fowle never tired of the phantasmagoria of Upper Richmond Road. The interminable intermittent vision of food dead and alive, and of performers performing the same performance from everlasting to everlasting, and of millions and millions of cigarettes ascending from the mouths of Hampson young men in incense to heaven. This rare vision of which in all his wanderings he had never seen the like, had the singular effect of lulling his soul into profound content. Not once did he arrive at the end of the vision. No, when he reached Barnes Station he could see the vision still stretching on and on. But, filled to the brim, he began into an omnibus and return. The omnibus awoke him to other issues. The omnibus was an antidote. In the omnibus, cleanliness was nigh to godliness. On one pane, a soap was extolled, on another, the exordium, for this is a true saying and worthy of all acceptation, was followed by the statement of a religious dogma, while on another pane was an urgent appeal not to do in the omnibus, which you would not do in a drawing room. Yes, Priam Fowl had seen the world, but he had never seen a city so incredibly strange, so packed with curious and rare psychological interest as London. And he regretted that he had not discovered London earlier in his lifelong search after romance. At the corner of the high street he left the omnibus and stopped a moment to chat with his tobacconist. His tobacconist was a stout man in a white apron who stood forever behind a counter and sold tobacco to the most respected residents of Putney. All his ideas were connected either with tobacco or with Putney. 
A murder in the Strand to that tobacconist was less than the breakdown of a motor bus opposite Putney Station, and a change of government less than a change of programme at the Putney Empire. A rather pessimistic tobacconist, not inclined to believe in a first cause, until one day a drunken man smashed Salmon and Luckstone's window down the high street, whereupon his opinion of Providence went up for several days. Prime enjoyed talking to him, that the tobacconist was utterly impervious to ideas and never gave out ideas. This morning the tobacconist was at his door. At the other corner was the sturdy old woman whom Prime had observed from his window. She sold flowers. Fine old woman, that, said Prime heartily, after he and the tobacconist had agreed upon the fact that it was a glorious morning. She used to be at the opposite corner by the station until last May but one, when the police shifted her, said the tobacconist. Why did the police shift her? asked Brown. I don't know as I can tell you, said the tobacconist, but I remember her this twelve year. I only noticed her this morning, said Brown. I saw her from my bedroom window coming down the Werter Road. I said to myself, she's the finest old woman I ever saw in my life. Did you now? murmured the tobacconist. She's rare and dirty. I like her to be dirty, said Priam stoutly. She ought to be dirty. She wouldn't be the same if she were clean. I don't know with dirt, said the tobacconist calmly. She'd be better if she had a bath of a Saturday night like other folks. Well, said Priam, I want an ounce of the usual. Thank you, sir, said the tobacconist, putting down three halfpence change out of sixpence, as Priam thanked him for the packet. Nothing whatever in such a dialogue, yet Priam left the shop with a distinct feeling that life was good, and he plunged into the high street, lost himself in crowds of perambulators and nice womanly women who were bustling honestly about in search of food or raiment. Many of them carried little red books full of long lists of things which they and their admirers and the offspring of mutual affection had eaten or would shortly eat. In the high street all was luxury, not unnecessary in the street. Even the baker's shops were a mass of sultana and Berlin pancakes. Illuminated calendars, gramophones, corsets, picture postcards, manila cigars, bridge scorers, chocolate, exotic fruit and commodious mansions. These seemed to be the principal objects offered for sale in High Street. Priam bought a sixpenny edition of Herbert Spencer's Essays for fourpence halfpenny, and passed on to Putney Bridge, whose noble arches divided a first story of vans and omnibuses from a ground floor of barges and racing eights and he gazed at the broad river and its hanging gardens, and dreamed, and was awakened by the roar of an electric train shooting across the stream on a red causeway a few yards below him. And, miles off, he could descry the twin towers of the Crystal Paris, more marvellous than mosques. Astounding, he murmured joyously. He had not a care in the world, and Putney was all that Alice had painted it. In due time, when bells appealed to right and to left of him, he went home to her. Collapse of the Putney System Now, just at the end of lunch, over the last stage of which they usually sat a long time, Alice got up quickly in the midst of her stilton, and going to the mantelpiece took a letter therefrom. I wish you'd look at that, Emery, she said, handing him the letter. It came this morning, but of course I can't be bothered with that sort of thing in the morning, so I'll put it aside. He accepted the letter, and unfolded it with a professional all-knowing air, which even the biggest male fool will quite successfully put on in the presence of a woman if consulted about business. When he had unfolded the thing, it was typed on stiff, expensive quarto paper, he read it. In the lives of beings like Priam, Fall and Alice, a letter such as that is a terrible event, unique, earth-arresting. Simple recipients are apt on receiving it to imagine that the Christian era has come to an end. But tens of thousands of similar letters are sent out from the city every day, and the city thinks nothing of them. The letter was about Cahoon's Brewery Company, Limited, and it was signed by a firm of solicitors. It referred to the verbatim report, which it said would be found in the financial papers, at the annual meeting of the company held at the Cannon Street Hotel on the previous day, and to the exceedingly unsatisfactory nature of the chairman's statement. It regretted the absence of Mrs. Alice Chalice, her change of condition had not yet reached the heart of Cahoon's, from the meeting, and asked her whether she would be prepared to support the action of a committee which had been formed to eject the existing board 
and which are already a following of 385,000 votes. It finished by asserting that unless the committee was immediately lifted to absolute power, the company would be quite ruined. Pryor reread the letter aloud. What does it all mean? asked Alice quietly. Well, said he, that's what it means. Does it mean, she began, by Jove, he explained, I forgot. I saw something on a placard this morning about cocoons, and I thought it might interest you, so I bought it. So saying, he drew from his pocket the Financial Times, which he had entirely forgotten. There it was, a column and a quarter on the chairman's speech, and nearly two columns of stormy scenes. The chairman was the Marquis of Drumgoldy, but his rank had apparently not shielded him from the violence of expletives such as liar, humbug, and even rogue. The Marquis had merely stated, with every film on over apology, that, owing to the extraordinary depreciation in licensed property, the directors had not felt justified in declaring any dividend at all on the ordinary shares of the company. He had made this quite simple assertion, and instantly a body of shareholders, less reasonable and more avaricious even than shareholders usually are, had begun to turn the Cannon Street Hotel into a bear garden. One might have imagined that the sole aim of brewery companies was to make money, and that the patriotism of old-world brewers, that patriotism which impelled them to supply an honest English beer to the honest English working man at a purely nominal price, was scorned and forgotten. One was indeed forced to imagine this. In vain the Marquis pointed out that the shareholders had received a 15% dividend for years and years past, and that really, for once in a way, they ought to be prepared to sacrifice a temporary advantage for the sake of future prosperity. The thought of those regular high dividends gave rise to no gratitude in shareholding hearts. It seemed merely to render them the more furious. The baser passions had been let loose in the Cannon Street Hotel. The directors had possibly been expecting the baser passions, for a posse of policemen was handy at the door, and one shareholder, to save him from having the blood of marquises on his soul, was ejected. Ultimately, according to the picturesque phrases of the Financial Times report, the meek team broke up in confusion. How much have you got in cahoons? Priam asked Alice, after they had looked through the report together. All I have is in cahoons, said she, except his house. Father left it me like that. He always said there was nothing like a brewery. I've heard him say many and many a time a brewery is better than consoles. I think there's two hundred five pound shares. Yes, that's it. But of course they're worth much more than that. They're worth about £12 each. All I know is they bring me in £150 a year as regular as the clock. What's that there about broke up in confusion? She pointed with her finger to a paragraph, and he read in a low voice the fluctuation of Cahoon's ordinary shares during the afternoon. They had finished at £6, five shillings. Mrs Henry Leake had lost over £1,000 in about half a day. They've always brought me in £150 a year, she insisted, as though she'd been saying, it's always been Christmas Day on the 25th of December, and of course it will be the same this year. It doesn't look as if they bring you in anything this time, said he. Oh, but Henry, she protested. Beer had failed. That was the truth of it. Beer had failed. Who would have guessed that beer could fail in England? The wisest, the most prudent men in Lombard Street have put their trust in beer as the last grand bullock of that nation, and even beer had failed. The foundations of England's greatness were, if not gone, going. Insufficient to argue bad management, indiscreet purchases of licence at inflated prices. In the excellent old days, a brewery would stand an indefinite amount of bad management. Times were changed. The British workman, caught in a wave of temperance, could no longer be relied upon to drink. It was the crown of his sins against society. Trade unions were nothing in the places caprice of his, which spread desolation in a thousand genteel homes. Alice wondered what her father would have said had he lived. On the whole, she was glad that he did not happen to be alive. The shock to him would have been too rude. The floor seemed to be giving way under Alice, melting into a sort of bog that would swallow her up her and her husband. For years, without any precise information, but merely by instinct, she had felt that England, beneath the surface, was not quite the island it had been, and here was the awful proof. 
She gazed at her husband, as a wife ought to gaze at her husband in a crisis. His thoughts were much vaguer than hers, his thoughts about money being always extremely vague. Suppose you went up to the city and saw Mr. What's-his-name, she suggested, meaning the signatory of the letter. Me? It was a cry of the soul aghast, a cry drawn out of him sharply by a most genuine, cruel alarm. Him to go up to the city to interview a solicitor? Why, the poor dear woman must be demented. He could not have done it for a million pounds. The thought of it made him sick, raising the whole of his lunch to his throat as if by some sinister magic. She saw and translated the look on his face. It was a look of horror. And at once she made excuses for him to herself. At once she said to herself that it was no use pretending that her Henry was like other men. He was not. He was a dreamer. He was at times amazingly peculiar. But he was her Henry. In any other man than her Henry, a hesitation to take charge of his wife's financial affairs would have been ridiculous. It would have been effeminate. But Henry was Henry. She was gradually learning the truth. He was adorable, but he was Henry. With magnificent strength of mind, she collected herself. No, she said cheerfully. As there are shares, perhaps I'd better go. Unless we both go. She counted his eye again and added quietly. No, I'll go alone. He sighed his relief. He could not help sighing his relief. And after meticulously washing up and strengthening, she departed, and Priam remained solitary with his ideas about married life and the fiscal question. Alice was assuredly the very mirror of discretion. Never, since that unanswered query as to savings of the Grand Babylon, had she subjected him to any inquisition concerning money. Never had she talked of her own means, save in casual phrase now and then, to assure him that there was enough. She had indeed refused banknotes diffidently offered to her by him, telling him to keep them by him till need of them arose. Never had she discoursed of her own past life, nor led him on to discourse of his. She was one of those women for whom neither the past nor the future seems to exist. They are always so occupied with the important present. He and she had both of them relied on their judgment of character as regarded each other's worthiness and trustworthiness. And he was the last man in the world to be a Chancellor of the Exchequer. To him... Money was a quite uninteresting token that had to pass through your hands. He had always had enough of it. He had always had too much of it. Even at Putney he had had too much of it. The better part of Henry Leake's £200 had remained in his pockets, and under his own will he had his pound a week, which he never spent more than a few shillings. His distractions were tobacco, which cost him about twopence a day, walking about and enjoying colour effects and oddities of the streets, which cost him naught, and reading. There were three shops in Putney where all that is greatest in literature could be bought for fourpence halfpenny a volume. Do what he would, he could not read away more than ninepence a week. He was positively accumulating money. You may say that he ought to have compelled Alice to accept money. The idea never occurred to him. In his scheme of things, money had not been a matter of sufficient urgency to necessitate an argument with one's wife. She was always welcome to all that he had. And now, suddenly, money acquired urgency in his eyes. It was most disturbing. He was not frightened, he was merely disturbed. If he had ever known the sensation of wanting money and not been able to obtain it, he would probably have been frightened. But this sensation was unfamiliar to him. Not once in his whole career has he hesitated to change gold from fear that the end of gold was at hand. All kinds of problems crowded round him. He went out for a stroll to escape the problems, but they accompanied him. He walked through exactly the same streets as had delighted him in the morning, and they had ceased to delight him. This surely could not be ideal Putney that he was in. It must be some other place of the same name. The mismanagement of a brewery a 150 miles from London, the failure of the British working man to drink his customary pints in several scattered scores of public houses, have most unaccountably not the bottom out of the Putney system of practical philosophy. Putney posters were now merely disgusting. Putney trade gross and futile. The tobacconist are narrow-minded and stupid bourgeois, and so on. Alice and he met on their doorstep, each in the act of pulling out a latchkey. 
Oh, she said when they were inside. It's done for. There's no mistake. It's done for. We shan't get a penny this year. Not one penny. And he doesn't think there'll be anything next year either. And the shells will go down yet, he says. I never heard of such a thing in all my life, did you? He admitted sympathetically that he had not. After she'd been upstairs and come down again, her mood suddenly changed. Well, she smiled, whether we got anything or not, it's tea time. Say, so we'll have tea. I've no patience with worrying. I said I should make pastry after tea, and I will too. See if I don't. The tea was perhaps slightly more elaborate than usual. After tea, he heard her singing in the kitchen, and he was moved to go and look at her. There she was, with her sleeves turned back and a large pinafore apron over her rich bosom, kneading flour. He would have liked to approach her and kiss her, but he never could accomplish feats of that kind at unusual moments. Oh, she laughed, you can look. I'm not worrying. I've no patience with worrying. Later in the afternoon he went out, rather like a person who has reasons for leaving inconspicuously. He made a great, a critical resolve. He passed furtively down Water Road into the High Street, and then stood a moment outside Storley's stationery shop, which is also a library, an emporium of leather bags and an artist's colourments. He entered Storley's, blushing, trembling. He, a man of fifty who could not see his own toes, and asked for certain tubes of colour. An energetic young lady who seemed to know all about the graphic arts endeavoured to sell to him a magnificent and complicated box of paints, which opened out into an easel and a stool, and contained a palette of a shape preferred by the late Edwin Long, R.A., a selection of colours which had been approved by the late Lord Leighton, P.R.A., and a patent drying oil, which, she said, had been used by Whistler. Priam Fowle got away from the shop without this apparatus for the confection of Master Peters, but he did not get away without a sketching book, which he had no intention of buying. The young lady was too energetic for him. He was afraid of being too curt with her, lest she should turn on him and tell him that pretense was useless. She knew he was Priam Fowle. He felt guilty, and felt that he looked guilty. As he hurried along the high street towards the river with the paint box, it appeared to him the policemen observed him inimicably and cocked their helmets at him, as who should say, See here, this won't do. You're supposed to be in Westminster Abbey. You'd be locked up if you're too brazen. The time was out. He sneaked down to the gravelly shore a little above the steamer pier and hid himself between the piles, glancing around him in a scared fashion. He might have been about to, to commit a crime. Then he opened the sketchbook and oiled the palette and tried the elasticity of the brushes on his hand. And he made a sketch of the scene before him. He did it very quickly, in less than half an hour. He had made thousands of such colour notes in his life, and he would never part with any of them. He had always hated to part with his notes. Doubtless his cousin Duncan had them now, if Duncan had discovered his address in Paris, as Duncan probably had. When it was finished, he inspected the sketch, half shutting his eyes and holding it about three feet off. It was good except for a few pencil scrawls done in sheer absent-mindedness and hastily destroyed, this was the first sketch he had made since the death of Henry Leake. But it was very good. No mistake who's done that, he murmured, and added, That's the devil of it. Any expert would twig it in a minute. There's only one man that could have done it. I should have to do something worse than that. He shut up the box, and with a bang, as an amative couple came into sight, he need not have done so, for the couple vanished instantly in deep disgust at being robbed of their retreat between the piles. Alice was nearing the completion of pastry when he returned in the dusk. He smelt the delicious proof. Creeping quietly upstairs, he deposited his brushes in an empty attic at the top of the house. Then he washed his hands with a special care to remove all odour of paint. And at dinner, he endeavoured to put on the mien of innocence. She was cheerful but it was the cheerfulness of determined effort. They naturally talked of the situation. It appeared that she had a reserve of money in the bank, as much as would suffice her for quite six months. He told her with false buoyancy that there need never be the slightest difficulty as to money. He had money, and he could always earn more. If you think that I'm going to let you go into another situation, she said, you're mistaken, that's all. And her lips were firm. This staggered him. 
He knew, could, never could remember for more than half an hour at a time that he was a retired valet, and it was decidedly not her practice to remind him of the fact. The notion of himself in a situation as valet was half ridiculous and half tragical. He could no more be a valet than he could be a stockbroker or a wire walker. I, 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 I wasn't thinking of that, he stammered. Then what were you thinking of? she asked. Oh, I don't know, he said vaguely. Because these things they advertise, homework, envelope addressing, or selling gramophones on commission, they're no good, you know. He shuddered. The next morning, he bought a 36 by 24 canvas and more brushes and tubes and surreptitiously introduced them into the attic. Happily, it was the charwoman's day and Alice was busy enough to ignore him. With an old table and a tray out of a travelling trunk, he arranged a substitute for an easel and began to try to paint a bad picture from his sketch. But in a quarter of an hour, he discovered that he was exactly as fitted to paint a bad picture as to be a valet. He could not sentimentalise the tones, nor falsify the values. He simply could not. The attempt to do so annoyed him. All men are capable of stooping beneath their highest selves, and in several directions Priam Fowle could have stooped. But not on canvas. He could only produce his best. He could only render nature as he saw nature. And it was instinct rather than conscience that prevented him from stooping. In three days, during which he kept Alice out of the attic, partly by lies and partly by locking the door, the picture was finished. And he had forgotten all about everything except his profession. He had become a different man, a very excited man. By Jove, he exclaimed, surveying the picture, I can paint. Artists do occasionally soliloquise in this way. The picture was dazzling. What atmosphere, what poetry, and what profound fidelity to nature's facts. It was precisely such a picture as he was in the habit of selling for £800 or £1,000 before his burial in Westminster Abbey. Indeed, the trouble was that it had Priam Fowl written all over it, just as the sketch had. End of chapter 6